the white middle class kids were, they were singing it too. <laughs> and we were like, yo, what's up? <laughs> And they were like, no, man, no, no, dude, no, dude, no, dude. <laughs> and, and, and it took understanding that, that, that for some, when, when their mother told them to go to the store and, the, and they drove their mother's BMW or their mother's Mercedes Benz, they were being profiled by police officers. Because they thought they, whatever, you, you're driving a better car than we have. So, so there was an animus too. Different systems and different uh, feelings, but that song crossed over. And so as I was teaching and hip hop became more of a thing, I began to look at both, uh, both sides of hip hop, right? So, so you had this kind of, and I don't do the whole secular sacred thing, I, I, I don't do it, and there's a number of reasons, maybe somebody asked me why, but, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't do that. So you look at both sides of it, and there were things that were so powerful theologically, like, there's a theology that's behind Tupac and behind N.W.A. There's a sense of, of urgency, of, of survival. There's also this sense of, you know, I, I, I've lost my mind to the point that on one day I love women, on the next day I'm absolutely a misogynist. That there's a real, the real is, and I don't affirm, I, I don't, uh, 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 I, 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 I am not a misogynist, I don't appreciate it, I don't affirm it. Um, but there's a sincerity of someone who's been traumatically uh, oppressed in a system where they see women in a different lens. And to be able to talk about that, to be vulnerable about that, talk about that, I pray that there's enough of us here to correct them. Right? I remember when Nelly had a song called Tip Drill. I don't know if you've seen the video of that. If you haven't, don't watch it. It's pretty rude. And the sisters at Spelman College, a historically black college, all women down in Atlanta, protested and actually disinvited him from coming to the campus. And I think that was phenomenal, strength and courage. But there's a theology behind this music. And what happens is because we can't deal with the surface of it, we want to peel in. It's the same way that theologically we couldn't deal with the blues, or we couldn't deal with the spirituals, or we couldn't deal with jazz. And the reality is we have to deal with it. I have a philosophy. Um, it's called the syndrome of the crying baby. Check this out. I have two sons, 14 and 12, love them dearly. I remember the days that both of them were born like it was yesterday. I was there, and, and I wanted to be the good dad. You know, so, so I remember the days for both of my sons. When, when I had them, I had them in a good Heisman tuck. They were in here, wasn't going nowhere. They were in here, and I was on the phone talking to somebody, and you know, the baby started to cry. And I said, hold on for a second, man. And you shake a little bit, you know, grab the baby up here, your little dude, I don't do that guy that goo-goo stuff. Your little dude, you all right? You know that, we're good? We're good, right? So you do the finger test to make sure they're not wet. You put them on the shoulder, gently massage. Don't, don't, I'm heavy-handed, don't pat. Right? It's my wife in my ear, don't pat the baby. Just gently massage, heavy-handed. Gently massage, right? You see the baby needs to burp. You know, do a little motion, whatnot. And, and the baby, and, and y'all know if you got little brothers, sisters, or you get your children around you, and when, when, then it stops. It's like the calm before the storm. And it goes to phase two. <laughs> y'all are calling back. I need both hands here. I gotta figure this thing out, right? And so you try, and, 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 and you know, the gas price is much cheaper then. I strap them in the car seat, put them in the minivan, try to drive around town a little bit. Had the little mirror up there so I could see back there. Yo, little man, you're right? And it's not that the baby couldn't communicate with me. I didn't understand. The baby knew clearly what the baby wanted. I just didn't get it. So now I'm like, I'm furious, man. I'm like, oh my God, you know, what am I going to do? So we go back in the house. And then, and I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Ah! Ah! I, I mean, I hear it in my ear now. Ah! And so I'm like, man, oh, my God. I, I, you know, it's like the game shows where you can have to do a 50-50 or you can call somebody. So 
I mean, I got two choices. I'm going to call my mother and my mother-in-law. And I love my mother-in-law. She was a phenomenal mother-in-law. And so I, I had to figure out who I call last. And I call my mother-in-law last, so I got to call my mom this time. Before I can say anything, what did you do to the baby? <laughs> <laughs> did you check him? Is he wet? You know, did you burn him? Did, 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 yeah, I did that. Well, you better figure that thing out, Pop. <laughs> Oh no, it's quiet again. <gasps> oh, now it's scary because it's like the baby's almost hyperventilating. Because <laughs> it is it hard. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And the point that I'm making is you fast forward. <laughs> Check this out, you fast forward 15 years. 15-year-olds don't cry like that. In order to get your attention and get you the response, 15-year-olds act out. They do everything you tell them not to do. Their, their, their activity gets raw, grittier, right? And I look at rap music, hip-hop culture the same way. Because when they're saying, don't push me, because I'm close to the edge, I'm trying not to lose my head. A ha 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 ha, nervous laughter. Sometimes I wonder how I keep from going on. You got somebody who's struggling mentally. Somebody who's asking for help, looking for somebody to give them attention and respond to them. But when the song comes on, what we gonna do? <laughs> Cracker short as my fuse. Ooh. On any good day, you wouldn't want to deal with that person. But that person is saying, hey, y'all didn't hear me when I was doing don't push me. Cut. Now I'm doing this, y'all still don't want to hear me. So I'm going to get rawer and grittier, more misogynistic, because i got to get your attention. And nobody wants to listen. And I would argue that's where we are most mainstream hip hop. Because nobody wants to listen. I don't like that stuff. Turn it off. Okay. Oh, that's garbage. You want to hear real music? And the point is, who's going to deal with the folks who are crying out? For those of us in ministry, we can't ignore those cries. And they're real. And you can name all the artists and you can listen to what they're saying. The folks need not only Jesus, but they need discipleship. They need somebody to walk with them who's not afraid of the grittiness of what they're saying, the rawness. We need to raise up some leaders who aren't afraid to go into the trenches and grab people by the arm and say, hey, I know it's rough, but I'm going to stick it out with you. So that's kind of where I am now. I was at Northeast University for 15 years as a music professor, chair of African American Studies Department from 08 to 12. Comfortable, complacent. I'll actually tell you a story. Uh, back in 2006, I accepted my call to ministry. My pastor then, Reverend James Dove, of Ebenezer Baptist Church in the south end of Boston, said, I want you to go take one or two classes from seminary. And I was like, nah, man. <laughs> I had a PhD, man. I, I told the Lord that after I got a PhD, I was done with school forever, man. That, that was what my motivation gave me through. And he said, listen, come on, come, let's ride down there. And he took me down to the old Cume office, walked me to the dean office. He and the dean actually were roommates in, on the hill at, at our main campus in South Hamilton. So he said, Al, Al, I want you to uh, meet Dr. Price. Dr. Price is Al Padilla. And uh, I want you to sign him up for Old Testament survey. And he put the money down. He paid for it. Now, I had the money. I, but, but him putting the money down was like, y'all, I, I got to do it. 
And so now, sitting in class, loving it. I'm eating this stuff up. I'm like, what class y'all got next? <laughs> right? And in and, and eight and a half years, true story, I had a phone call, 2013, 2014, and they're like, you have too many credits. You need to take one of these degrees. And so CUME is a Center for Urban Ministry Education. They had an urban, a, a, a master's in urban ministry leadership. I said, let me have that. And most people get the MDiv, right? Because that's the, the thing. I'm, I'm figuring I went to CUME, and their degree is urban ministry leadership. That's what I'm going to take. So I took that. And along the way, I got to have met some phenomenal friends, some great colleagues. I'm embarrass Molly for a second. I was in class with Molly's dad. So I'm phenomenal leader, phenomenal pastor, great man, great man of God. Dear friend, sitting in classes together, right? Both of us struggled. It took both of us a long time to get to it. Right? But, but you meet great people there. And so I got through, I graduated in 2014, and I wasn't even gonna graduate, y'all. I wasn't gonna graduate. The letter came home, they were like, you need to sign up and get your robe and gown. I was like, yo, mail me my stuff, I'm busy. And it was around the same time that one of my, my oldest son was graduating from like elementary school. Well, if daddy's not going to graduation, I ain't going to my graduation <laughs> either. <laughs> Fill out the paperwork. So we graduate 2014, May 2014. In the fall of 2014, I got a phone call from the president of a seminary in the Midwest. He said, we heard about you here, and we want to hire you as the senior vice president for academic affairs, provost. And I was like, what? He was like, yeah, would you come out and interview? I was like, no. <laughs> and he was like, what would it take? for us to get you out for an interview. I said, I'll give you two phone calls. This is the first. Let me know what you want me to think about for the second phone call. And if in the second phone call, I feel like there's something there and I've prayed and the Lord has told me to go, then I'll come. But I'm not coming for two days. I'm going to give you a half a day. I'm going to come on Friday morning. I'm going to leave Friday afternoon because I want to be home when my kids get home Friday evening because we got plans. And so he says, cool. He gave us some things to think about. Took the second call. In the meantime, God was like, go. And I was like, why, God? I got a good job, I'm comfortable. He said, because you've never, you've never been courted for something like this before. You need to have the experience. God knows what God has planned for you. You just don't know. So I went. I got the job. I turned it down. But before I went on the interview, I called three people. I called three people who were provosts at major places in Boston. And I talked to all three of them. One of them was the provost, the senior vice president of academic affairs at Gordon Conwell. I didn't know him, Dr. Lentz. But I called him because he was the provost at my seminary. And I, I figured that I should be able to talk to him and he would tell me the truth. That I'm an alum. And so I called him and he gave me some wonderful wisdom, some wonderful gems. And so when I turned the job down, I called all three back. And I called Dean Liss back. He said, we, we didn't know you wanted to teach at a seminary. Why'd you teach at Gordon Conway? I said, I didn't know I wanted to teach at a seminary either. I didn't apply for the job. I'm good. <laughs> and so he says, well, if you, if you taught at the seminary, what would you want to teach? I said, well, having been a student, you guys ain't got that going on in worship. I said, I think that's something that all of us do on a regular basis. And so they hired me as an adjunct to teach a course on worship in the spring of 2015. And you gotta track, track the chronology here. I'm still in Northeast, killing, complacent, feet on the desk. <laughs> <laughs> With no shoes on, I mean complacent. <laughs> like running the joint, right? And I get in the classroom at the seminary, and by the second week, there's a little murmuring of a revolution of the students saying that we need to keep him here. Right? I'm embarrassed, y'all. Y'all was, was in that class, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. See? 
there was a mumbling amongst the students. And the students went to the president and the dean and asked, could he, could y'all hire him here at the seminary? I didn't apply. I was praying because I was like, Lord, don't, don't, don't take me to the seminary. I didn't go to Eastern. I'm good. When I got hired in Northeastern, we ranked 165. By that time, we were ranked 37th in the country. Who wants to leave? When you, who does that? 165 to 37? Yo, I'm going to ride this thing out. <laughs> <laughs> so now the conversation has happened. And they called me back in the meeting and said, hey, you're working on something. When you adjunct again, sp spring 2016. That's like a year ago. It's a year ago. And I'm like, cool, I, I'll do it. I said, but I'm a musician, and I have big ears. So y'all got to say something to me so I can hear so we can have a conversation. July 1, 2016, I left Northeastern University and came to go to college with D.L.A. Center. God has big plans for you if you listen. Now, I'm still trying to explain to people why I left, because it don't make sense. It's not logical. Sometimes what God is doing in your life is not logical to everybody else. So I've had to learn not to try to convince people that I made the right decision and just trust God. And the way that I trust God is that God gives me affirmation and confirmation almost on a daily basis. Almost on a daily basis. There's not a day that doesn't go by where it's affirmed and confirmed that I made the right decision to make the shift. And so I can stand and, and just enjoy what God is doing. I don't know how long the season's gonna be. I'm not worried about it. I am worried about making sure that I'm obedient to what God calls me to do in my life. And that's why I stay re-energized, rejuvenated, and reconnected on a daily basis. So that's kind of how, I, long version of the short story, but, yeah, I love to tell a story. <laughs> I don't even know what time it is. We got to go. We good? Yeah, thank you. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Gracious God, for today and for these, your children, we thank you. God, for your love and for your mercy, for your grace, even now for your healing power for your power of restoration, for your power, God, to reach into our hearts and massage our hearts back to whole, to massage our minds, God, in a way that you would stimulate us, God, to do even more and to do even better. And then, God, how you created us, God, according to your purpose, but with your image, to love one another as we love you. Help us, O oh God. Heal us, O oh God. Hold on to us as you take us on this journey of faith. Avail to us, God, your understanding and wisdom so that we can be truly who you called us to be. God, we pray for our peers. We pray for our colleagues. We pray for our roommates, our sweet mates, our, 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 our folks, God, who, who we're in interaction with on a daily basis. God, we pray for our families. And then, God, we are not... We're not, we're not afraid to pray even for ourselves. You know the intersection of our needs. You know our desires, God. You know how we need you to show up and show out in our lives, God. So we pray that you would do so in your time, according to your will, and for your glory. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.